Bear Essentials podcast gives older bears a place to gather for real talk regarding topics and issues that they can relate to. Here at The Bear Essentials, we aren't just having conversations. We are looking to provide actionable intelligence through real-life experience and expertise of our guests. Our mission is to build a strong community that elevates and motivates people to go beyond their limiting beliefs by helping them realize that getting older is not an excuse to hibernate on their goals, but a reason to work harder. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Charles Wallace. Today's guest is a former British Royal Marine Commando and a covert counterterrorism operative. He's also one of the few people to row across the Atlantic Ocean solo. This man is referred to often as the real life James Bond. So without further ado, let's jump into my interview with Mike Bates. But first, a word from our sponsor. The Bear Essentials podcast is sponsored by Fire Beast Jerky. With flavors ranging from Tropical Flare to Sweet Reaper, Fire Beast has something for all jerky lovers. And with over 30 years of experience making small batch, big flavor jerky, Fire Beast is sure to deliver quality, affordable jerky directly to your doorstep anywhere in America. So head on over to firebeastjerky.com and be sure to use code BEAR10 at checkout and receive 10% off your order from Fire Beast, the heat that is sweet. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Thanks for joining me today. Charles, it's great to be here, man. Thanks for the invite. No, I really appreciate it, Mike. Um, could you uh, introduce yourself to the audience, please? So I'm Mike Bates. I'm from the UK, currently in Leeds in the north of the country. I've just returned from uh, rowing the Atlantic solo in 46 days. Uh, I'm a former Royal Marines commando, served our country in the MOD in the intelligence arena for 15 years after that. I'm a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. I've got an academy here in Leeds. And my purpose in life, Charles, I'm sure we'll get into this, is to try and help people. But my focus now specifically is trying to help men navigate midlife and get the next 45 years better than the first. Mike, that's fantastic. And I think um, that's where our uh, – it's definitely similar. What um, I'm hoping to accomplish with this podcast is to to help – you know, middle-aged men, especially. So, and I think when I, when I came across you and what, you know, what you've done and what you're doing, I, I thought it was a great fit to have you on your, on the show. Um, would you mind talking a little bit about uh, your time in the, uh, in the military? Sure. So uh, age 20. So we're talking 22 years ago and I'm a 42 year old man, as you can tell. Um, I joined the Royal Marines as a commando, I was awarded my Green Beret in 2001, uh, went on to serve in Afghanistan 2002, Iraq for the war 2003, attached to Special Forces, and then 2004 went to Northern Ireland for six months. So I got to see a lot of operations in a very short space of time. Um, and if I reflect back on what I was trying to do there, for me, it was trying to find a brotherhood. It was trying to find a belonging. I didn't really have, I still don't have a great relationship with my own father. And I felt lost. So I was trying to connect. I was trying to be a part of something bigger than myself. And then as I've come to realize, that was the first iteration, really, of me serving others. And uh, thankfully, I came back alive and got some great experience from that leadership. Like I say, I went on to serve in the MOD then for 15 years. But ultimately, my military career was finding who I am, connecting with people, and then serving other people in our, in our country and keeping us safe. So, Mike, since you've been out of the military, you the way you spoke about that, about the brotherhood, things like that, what what have you found to be different since you've left the military? And what have you found to be very similar? Well, I think we're all one of the greatest lessons from the ocean um, was that, you know, we're, we're social beings. We, we need to connect. It's one thing I think men don't do very well is we don't talk, we don't connect, we don't open up. I'm not vulnerable enough. Certainly when I was in the military, I wore a mask, you know, I'm courageous, I'm brave, you know, I'm not scared of this, I can do that. You know, that's all rubbish, really. It's a mask we wear to cover up our vulnerabilities. And what I've learned as I've got older is real strength, real courage is being vulnerable. It's connecting. So jiu-jitsu for me, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and the, the academy that I own here in Leeds replicates that for me. It's the community. It's people coming together for a greater good. It's supporting each other. 
it's talking, it's sharing, it's being vulnerable, and it's helping other people. And for me, that's why we're here. You know, it's 46 days alone on the ocean, day and night, no one around. You realise very, very quickly that we're here to connect, and it's as simple as that. Yeah, and we're definitely going to get into that because I think that um, – what you what you did across the Atlantic was absolutely amazing. Um, as far as jujitsu, how long have you been studying? I started training jujitsu before I went to Afghanistan in two thousand and two. So twenty years I've been grappling. I was awarded my black belt in two thousand and seventeen. So I've been a black belt for six years. Anyone who knows Brazilian jujitsu will know that it takes a long time to you know earn your black belt. I think I was the first Marine or one of the first Marines to ever receive their Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Um, and I started actually because our mission in Afghanistan was in the Tora Bora region. So we're trying to find Bin Laden. We're in the caves. And we thought, well, we better learn how to fight with our hands if we're in the caves, man. Uh, and that's where it started. And I've done it ever since. And for me, jiu-jitsu is a real leveler. You know, it doesn't matter you know, if you're rich or you're poor or you're fit or you're not fit or what background you come from. On the mat, we're all equal. And I love that. I love the idea that we go somewhere we choose to go and we choose to suffer. We choose to lose. And I always say to my students, the mat is a mirror. It shows the real you. How do you win? How do you lose? Are you here for yourself? Or are you here for others? And so that's the message I'm always giving my students. But yeah, 22 years on the mat is a long time. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, I'm definitely familiar with jujitsu. My son, it, my son trains. So I, I like to ask anybody on here who who trains jujitsu. Who who did you receive your black belt under? Uh, Professor Victor Estima. Uh, he's the younger brother of Braulio Estima. Who, uh, yeah, the, the people who came to the UK with Mauricio Gomez, who's Roger Gracie's father. Roger Gracie came over Braulio and Victor. So the lineage for me. From Mitsu Maeda through Carlos Gracie Jr., say Hadiola, Victor, then me. So it's a very tight lineage, and I'm very, very proud of that. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Like we could uh, we could probably have a, a a decent sized podcast about that in itself. Where where I'm at in the United States in the Philadelphia area, it's a pretty uh, right in my area. It's pretty um, it's a good hotbed for jujitsu. There's a there's a school. Um, Gracie Jiu Jitsu School. Uh, my son, he actually uh, he wrestled in college. He he's an amateur MMA fighter, and he trains his Jiu Jitsu under uh, James Booth. And it just um, it's it's definitely I'm I'm always fascinated by it. I did some training myself right around uh, blue belt, not not your level, but I I understand. <laughs> so that that's fantastic. So so Mike, as far as you you go from the military i can hear just by speaking with you like what you're really your your mission just it, it exudes out of you what you what you're trying to accomplish and i think that's fantastic how from you know the military jujitsu so how how does the rowing come about how do you get into that okay so i left the royal marines in 2005 i was heading down the special forces pathway the marines wanted me to go do my commission i just felt that the thing I wanted most out of life was a family. And I knew either one of those two choices was going to put me deeper down the military hole. Or, you know, I wouldn't have a family. So mm. I decided to leave. I applied for a job, which I thought no one could even get. And that was in the intelligence arena of the Ministry of Defense. or we'll just kind of leave it there. And, uh, and I got that job. And I served our country 15 years in operations. Um, in 12 years ago, on Monday, so two days ago, my youngest son was born. He was nine weeks early and uh, he had uh, he was in the hospital for a long time. Then he got meningitis, a really, really poorly baby. And the hospital here saved his life. Mm. So in 2019, I was like, look, I want to raise some money for this unit. I realized in intensive care that our National Health Service doesn't buy the specialist equipment. It provides the doctors, the nurses, the infrastructure. But the specialist equipment that poorly babies need, charities supply it, right? So I'm going to raise some money. What's the most ridiculous thing can I, that I can do that no one does that I can raise some money from? And I found Ocean Rowing. And I went to the MOD. This was about lockdown, right? 2020. I said, I want to go row in this ocean. And they said, you can't do it. You, you work in the covert space. Mm. And they gave me an ultimatum. 
keep doing your 20 year career or leave and do the road. And I'm always telling people that you've got to be brave. You've got to have some courage and follow, follow your instincts. So I left that career in 2020 to prepare and row for this ocean. And that's when I started my academy in lockdown. And that took a huge amount of courage to do that. Um, but I haven't looked back. It's been the best decision of my life. Yeah, I know when I, um, when I, you know, started kind of communicating with you via LinkedIn, um, and I saw what you were doing. I, I, I literally, I had to read it twice because I was like, what, what, what? Um, so, so you're, you're rowing, you're looking to raise money for the hospital in Leeds. Um, it gets to the point where, where's the idea that you're, you know, Hey, rowing. Right. But I'm going to row across the Atlantic ocean. Like how, what's the genesis of that? Well, I mean, look, I wanted to raise a significant amount of money. I wanted to raise seventy thousand pounds. We've actually raised one hundred and seventy-five thousand pounds, which is amazing. Like, no one's going to give you money these days with respect to go row. You know, go run a half marathon or go run a marathon. If I put a gun to your head today, Charles, you could go run a marathon right now. So I had to find something which, when you tell people, they're they're looking at you like you've either gone mad or it doesn't exist. And you know, more people climb Mount Everest every year than have ever rowed an ocean solo. So when you start to think about it in that sense, this is something quite special and unique. Um, I'm five foot eight. I've never rode in my life. I've never been out to sea longer than a couple of months to get to Afghanistan. So again, it was something I wasn't familiar with. It was a new skill I had to learn. It's going to take me three and a half years to prepare. And we could talk about mindset and goal setting perhaps later or another time. That's my speciality. I believe we've got to pick big goals a long way out. And... Um, and that was mine, man. And, and still now, the, the, the greatest thing of rowing that ocean isn't getting to the other side, isn't getting to Antigua. It's raising the money and saving the lives of poly babies here in our community. But it's also how it's impacted and inspired so many people. Mm. And they still bump into people today and they're looking at me like with this shock and awe that the, this person in front of them has been on the road for 46 days and nights and rode 3,000 miles. They just can't, they just can't conceptualize it. And for me, that's the magic. Yeah, it, it, it definitely is. It's amazing what you did. And just to tell, in passing yesterday, I mentioned to someone that I was going to be interviewing you, a uh, former military uh, person who rode across the Atlantic. Just kind of nothing much more said. Got a call last night and they said, hey, did you say the guy rode across the Atlantic Ocean? I said, yeah. So it, it was just kind of funny to me that it, it at first it was kind of like didn't resonate, but then it, it did. It resonated. They they actually reached back out and asked about it. Um, so I definitely want to get into mindset and all that good stuff. I, that's one of the things I do. Um, I did want to talk a little bit first about. I mean, you mentioned it a little bit, but I I did not just the physicality of having to row across the Atlantic, like. Mike, what was that like as far as, you know, what goes through your mind? I, I I think that obviously physically it would be extremely difficult, but I do think even for, for me mentally being isolated and alone for that amount of time, how do you deal with that along with the whole physicality, which I'm sure along the way you're, you know, you're exerting yourself. It makes you weaker as far as physically, which can prey on your mind too. How do you, how do you handle all of that combined? You must prepare well. Um, there's three solo rowers still out in the middle of the Atlantic right now as we speak who started before me. I was the last boat to leave La Gomera. Um, you have to prepare well. If you're going to go and do anything in life, you know, you've know you got to put the work in. This was a three-and-a-half-year project. I said to my S&C coach at the beginning, I will not miss one rep in the gym in the next three years, and I didn't do that. I was rowing a marathon row every New Year's Day at 5 a.m. when everyone else is out partying and sleeping it off. You know, I prepared really well. Um, 200 hours at sea in my boat as well. But look, I'm telling you, man, even with that preparation, once you're out there on your own, nothing can prepare you for that. Mm. The chronic sleep deprivation was an absolute killer. I was an emotional wreck every day. I narrated this on um, through through a friend of mine on Instagram, by the way. So if anyone wants to see my row, go to Mike Bates it's Official. You can see every post. I spent most of the time crying, mm. and most of the time scared. And my heart and my nervous system right now is in a real bad place because 
I was anxious and stressed every single minute of every day. You can't prepare for that. You mm. can't prepare for the solitude. You can't prepare for the dark places you're going to go. What you need to do is have a tremendous amount of motivation. And for me, interestingly, the motivation at the beginning was raising the money and inspiring people. On the ocean, my only motivation was to get home to see my wife and kids alive as fast as I could. And again, that comes back to human connection. It comes back to the people we love and the people who love us. It's accepting that love and giving it back. That is the only reason we're here, man. And for some people listening, that's going to sound a bit kind of deep. I'm telling you, if you go out into the ocean in the dead of night, in the huge weather we had, when you're not sure if you're going to come back or not, the only thing you think about is the people you care about, nothing else. That's that's how you do it. Simple as that. So, Mike, I, I do want to paint a picture. Hearing you say that now, just something clicked with me also, and I want to try to paint a picture here for the uh, for the audience. When when I when I read you row the Atlantic solo, are you truly solo or is there precautions? Is there other things around that you're solo, but you're, you're kind of not solo and you could connect if need be like, what, what exactly is it? Yeah. So within about 12 hours of the row, you know, I didn't see any other human beings for the rest of the time. You could see, I saw about five or six ships vessels from a distance, about two miles away in the whole time but you are completely alone. And part of the rules of that race is that no one can interact with the boat in any way. Otherwise, you, you know, you don't, you don't complete the race. Of course, as I said in my finish interview, and everyone can get that on YouTube if they want the Atlantic campaigns, I saw it as a solo robot team effort. So of course, there was a safety team on land, monitoring my progress, making sure I was okay. We had massive weather. Like, ridiculous. I can't articulate the size of the weather. It was crazy. Um, and so you need that safety support. And they were there on land before I set off to make sure I'd done the training. The kit was right. I knew what I was doing. And then I had a, a team, I had a weather router to help me plan the best route. I had my social media guy. And that's it. But on the ocean, you are alone. And there's no putting up a sail. There's no protection from the sun. There's no motors. There's no nothing. It's two oars, 24-foot rowing boat you against the ocean and you can't win by the way you know before i stepped foot on the boat and i just spoke to this about someone to someone this morning i felt the same feeling as when i used to compete in jiu-jitsu i felt like i was going to have a fight but this time it's against an opponent that i could never beat for the nature so it's about performing the best i could possibly do and take the least amount of damage come on alive and that's all you can do man man that just hearing you say that and just thinking it through, it, it just makes it even more amazing to me. Um, so during that time, were there times where you thought about quitting? No, I don't quit. Mm. Uh, when I joined the Royal Marines when I was 20 years old, my uncle, he put a, a wager on me, bet me 50 pounds that I would get through the commando course because he knew how difficult it was. But when I stepped foot across that line in Limston Commando in the UK to go and start my commando course, eight months long, by the way, hardest military course in the world, basic training, there was not one day that I thought I was quitting. And on the ocean, there's never a day I thought I was going to stop. Like, just I just don't do that. But the reason I don't do that is because it's not because I'm this superhuman or I'm, you know, got something that other people haven't got. Everyone's got that ability. But you need to have evidence that you're able to do it. So I always speak when I, when I do my talks about building this wall of evidence behind you. And every time you go out there and set yourself a goal and achieve it, you've got some bricks behind you there. You put in another brick in that wall. And what happens is over time is you build this wall higher and higher. So when you go out there and you're presented with a real challenge, you can look behind you with confidence and go, you know what? I can do this. And so was I scared for my life? Yeah. Was it the most challenging thing I've ever done in my life? Yeah. I think I was going to quit. Never. Yeah, that's definitely inspiring stuff, Mike. Really, really is. So um, the last thing I want to ask you about the row before we talk a little more about some mindset motivation is this. Knowing what you know now, would you do it again? No. And here's the reason. I don't feel like I've got anything else to prove. 
Um, I, I talk to my students about my military career. I've been on podcasts before. I've been interviewed. You know, when I did this, and we, we do this a lot, was, you know, back in the day when I did this, one of the things I've realized, it was someone actually who wrote a post on LinkedIn and a guy called Ollie Goss, a pro- former professional rugby player. And he, he put myself and a guy called Kevin Sinfield, who's a very famous guy over here, raised a lot of money for charity, ex-professional rugby player, captain of England. And he said we were heroes in his eyes, which for me is a, a crazy idea. The reason he said that is because he knew that I played this out live. This wasn't something back in the day. This was in front of everybody, live for everyone to see. Everyone's seen the real me. Everyone's seen my face. They've seen me at my highest. They've seen me at my lowest. But they've seen what I'm capable of. And so I don't feel like I need to do anything like this ever again. I view it as the pinnacle, the summit of the first half of my life. And so now as I look forward to the second half, that second mountain, the second half of my life, I don't need to do anything big like this again. What I need to do is live a real moral existence. I need to help people. I need to inspire people through other means. And this is just one of them, mate, just talking about it. I have no reason or compulsion to go and risk my life again and be away from my family. I've got nothing to prove. And that's a great feeling. Man, um, First off, I appreciate the openness and the honesty with which you answered that question. Um, and I, I'm not going to lie, I, I part of me expected to you say, "Hell yeah, I'd do it again in a heartbeat." And I, it was just refreshing that answer. So, so thank you for that. So, so Mike, a little bit I want to talk about because on this podcast, what you know, definitely not to the level of you, but I, you know, I had my own issues with weight and heart issues and the whole idea and genesis of this podcast was for me to try to give back. And that's, you know, thankfully men like you will join the show and we can try to help inspire and motivate others. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit as far as, you know, inspiration, motivation, you know, because a lot of people who watch this, you know, they'll hear that, you know, Mike Bates rode across the Atlantic ocean and, you know, for some people, that's a non-starter because they go, hell, I could never do anything like that. So what I want to try to talk to you about is how can you connect to the person who is maybe so far back that that's not even something they can even comprehend? Yeah, well, I mean, I've got my own principles that I'll share with you today. Uh, it's something that I speak about professionally and I'll share with people. And, and it's, I suppose when you, what I would say is there's, there's a lot of people out there who, who quote unquote call themselves motivational speakers. And what they've done is read a lot of books and they regurgitate it. What I'm going to tell you is distilled from that 20 year experience of operating on the front line in the military, operating against terrorists on the front line in the covert world, and then rowing oceans and being on the map. It's not about the size of the goal. It's about having a goal in the first place. You know, I always talk about movement creates opportunity. If you're not moving forward, you're going nowhere. Life is about purpose. It's about movement. It's about a mission. And you've got to find what that is. You've got to look inside. And once you've done that, once you've figured out what that purpose is, I'm going to give you my principles for mindset. And this is going to help anybody out there who wants to achieve any goal. All right? There's four things, M-I-N-D. Number one is M. You've got to have a deep motivation. All right. And when I talk about motivation, I don't mean uh, I want to lose a bit of weight. I would say what Sakichi Toyota said, the, the guy who started the Toyota dynasty, engineering dynasty. You've got to ask yourself the five whys. I would say it's the three whys for motivation. So if you say you want to lose weight, I'm going to say, well, why do you want to lose weight? That's the first why. I want to feel a bit better about myself. Okay, I'm unhealthy. I want to live a bit longer. Okay, why do you want to live a little bit longer? That's the second why. Well, I've got kids. You know, I want to be around for them and my grandkids. Okay, third why? Why do you want to be around for your kids? I love them. They're the most important thing in the world for me. I want to be a great role model for them. Right, now we're getting deep. Mm. Now we're talking about the real motivation. So when you're presented with the option of a pizza or a salad or a run or staying in bed, you're not thinking about losing weight. You're thinking about being there for your kids. So that, the first one is motivation. That's got to be deep. It's got to be intrinsic. It's got to mean something to you. The I is inspiration. You've got to inspire yourself and you've got to inspire others. If you can bring people along on a journey with you, Charles, that is just going to fuel this this movement 
And that is everything. You've said both of these words already. The third is the N. And that is something that I call nerve. You've got to start. In the US, in one of the colleges, they did a, a study about goal setting. And 92% of people who start a goal never get to the end. Mm. They never get to the end because they don't start. All right, so you've got to have the nerve to start. And I always say to people, tell everyone about your goal. Make yourself accountable to them. And I was telling people I was going to row an ocean three years before I rode the ocean. Mm. And people were asking me about it. And so I had to do it. So M-I-N and then D is discipline. You've got to have the self-discipline. And that comes in two forms for me. Firstly, it's about looking ahead and thinking, well, what are the challenges I'm going to face here? What's in my way? What are the bumps along the road in this path for me to achieve my goal? Because if you think about it ahead, you can start to make better choices. So maybe you stop buying cake every Friday. Maybe you stop buying beers and putting them in the fridge. That's going to stop you drinking them. But then it's the discipline every day. Mm. Going back to the motivation. You've got to live this every day of your life. I put something on Instagram yesterday about not looking past the next wave. You know, you've got to be thinking, what can I do this minute, this hour, this day, this week to bring me close to my goal? And it'll happen. So those four things, M A and D, motivation, inspiration, nerve, and discipline, as far as I'm concerned, is the blueprint for success. Mm. And whatever goal you set, if you do those four things, you'll achieve it. I I, lo- I love that, Mike. I um and as you were as you were saying it, I was thinking of my I was, in, you know, not using those principles, but I used those principles and didn't even realize Correct. it. And that's uh, that's fantastic. I love that you put some structure around it. I call it, you know. I know when I was when I was going about it, it was kind of just you know seat in my pants kind of thing. So so thank you for that, um, Mike. Where um, I I think more people should know about you um, than maybe do. I I'm fascinated. Um, where, where can they get in touch with you, keep up with you, things like that? Well, I'll, I'll say this first. I've got a, I can't speak openly about it, but I've signed a contract with a a major publishing house here in the UK. My kind of memoir, my story is going to be coming out in book form next year. Mm. Um, but any updates, if you go to mikebates.uk, um, put your email in there. We'll make sure that you're the first to hear about all these, these new and exciting things. Um, Mike Bates official on Instagram, Mike Bates on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, just, just stay in touch. You know, people keep saying this to me, you know, you've got a unique story. Um, you've achieved things that perhaps no one in the world's achieved in terms of a collection of things in my life. Um, and my mission, as I said at the beginning, mate, is to share it and help people specifically middle-aged men. So one of the things I want to do over the next 12 months is launch my new business called the next 45. And this is going to be a platform to educate men, to try and inspire them and to give them some standards to live their life by. Because I honestly believe, as you will know, and I can tell you know this already, you can have a better second half of your life than the first. You've just got to live it in a different kind of way. Mm. And far too many men are in between those two mountains, wishing they were still 20, wondering whether or not the wife that they're with is the wife they should be with, wondering if they can make more money and get a bigger house, bigger car. You've got to get off that mountain get to this second mountain which is all about moral existence doing things in your community strong relationship vocation and this is all stuff from a great book by david brooks called second mountain your readers should read this it will change their lives and um i'm just here to help so get in touch follow me on instagram let's do it together mike thank you so much um it's i gotta tell you it's kind of early here where i'm at today but this has got me more wired than my cup of coffee so i'm i'm ready to now head out and do my workout so this is great i appreciate the time mike uh thank you so much um for anyone watching please please keep up with mike it's men like this who will make and help you live better lives so please please look out and see what Mike's up to. Um, I'll just end with this. I think Mike had said it and the best way to kind of summarize this is regardless of what it is, what the goal is, I think we all need our ocean and we have to start trying to row it. So on that note, thank you all for tuning in. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye. This has been the bare essentials. Thanks for listening. And remember never hibernate on your goals. 